Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners. And since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you wanna put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today, we have Tyler Chesser. He is the co-founder and managing partner of CF Capital, a private equity real estate investment firm that focuses on acquiring and operating multifamily assets in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio. Tyler was previously a commercial real estate broker and holds nearly a decade of professional real estate experience. So thank you so much for being on the show, Tyler. Charles, it's great to be with you. And it is crazy to reflect back that now it has been 10 years in this business because it's gone by very fast. Um, but I'm excited to share with you some of my perspective and excited to learn from you as well today. Yeah, that's great. It's it's a much different climate in commercial real estate or real estate in general from 2013, I can tell you that. Oh, my, no doubt about it. I mean, <laughs> totally different world. I mean, totally different world outside of real estate, but within real estate as well. I mean, obviously <laughs> we've gone through what is probably described as the longest expansion in history in terms of the business cycle there in terms of real estate. Uh, and perhaps we're going through a little bit of a correction right now, maybe a lot of bit of a correction, depending on the side of the market that you're participating in. So it is interesting now, you know, because ever since I got started in the business, which was five years post great, great financial crisis, that's all I heard about. And, you know, things were still really on sale in 2013. And of course they became you know, tremendously uh, overpriced in many respects. And now we're seeing sort of a, a little bit of a change uh, of the of the tide, so to speak. Yeah, and it's amazing because if we did have anything, uh, even uh, even something a little bit resembling what happened for the in 2008, I mean, it takes so many years for it to come back. Yes, you bought them out like that in the 2009 or whenever they did for property prices in 2010. But it's it's just something that you just, it just takes many years to come back from it. Um, it's like when we were coming back from COVID and you had to like turn jobs on and turn things on and hire people and, uh, you know, people were starting to spend money again. It's, it's, it's crazy how long it takes. It's just not soft landing. And then you're back up. You know what I mean? As <laughs> we were having a call you. with, with one of our property managers yesterday and, and one of our regional managers. And we were talking about, you know, any asset, you know, it's like a cruise liner and the same as the case for the economy at a much larger scale in the, in the marketplace, it's a cruise liner. It does not turn on a dime. And so you've got to turn the, the dials before the ship actually starts to move in a different direction. And so, you know, some of that stuff is in our control. Some of it is out of our control, but it is interesting to, to note that, you know, the business moves slowly, but if you're not aware of where it's going, you know, it can be moving in one direction without any sort of uh, control from your end to say, well, where is it going to, where's it going to move? But of course there are many things in our control and I'm sure we'll talk about that today yeah. as well. So Tyler, give us a little bit uh, of a background, both personally and professionally prior to becoming a real estate broker and uh, eventually an investor. Absolutely. So I grew up middle class. Um, you know, I was always taught go to school, get good grades, you know, get a good job. And, you know, at some point right off into the sunset with your 401k and all those things, which I think most of us sort of middle class background are really taught. And, you know, I think that it's all it all comes from a good place because that's the information that was given to us. And that was the information that we had. And I followed that path when I got started as a professional. Uh, I started in the corporate world and I was kind of climbing the corporate ladder as a marketing professional, I was actually doing international marketing for a, a Fortune 500 organization, a restaurant company 
we were opening up the brand across many different markets across the world. I, I found it to be fascinating. I really enjoyed um, you know, that endeavor. And I was always fascinated with the psychology of business and perception of branding and positioning and really what that does in the marketplace, how you can create value there. And as I was climbing the corporate ladder, I started to recognize that the corporate America is extremely political and, you know, in, in more respects than, you know, how can I drive value? It's how long have you been in that seat and what sort of, what sort of positioning do you have from a political standpoint within the organization and otherwise to be able to get to that next level? And that didn't really resonate with me. And so it took me a few years to kind of wallow in that dissatisfaction, so to speak, to then make a transition. Ultimately, long story short, I got into real estate. I actually started as a residential agent and was selling houses on the side. And I didn't really know anything about real estate other than I had purchased a home myself. But when I started to learn about real estate, I then sort of put this one foot in the door and I looked around and said, wait a minute, real estate is not just single family homes. It's all of these other things. And as I started to learn about that, that's when I started to get really fascinated with the possibility of investment real estate and commercial real estate in particular. So I quickly transitioned to commercial real estate as a broker and you know, built my business and built my understanding of the marketplace through that, through serving other clients and other investors. And I learned so much in that experience, but I then also learned that, you know, there was so much that I didn't know. So I needed to go out there and get educated uh, to be able to serve my clients at the highest degree. Went out and got my CCIM designation, which is kind of the PhD of commercial real estate and learned all about the ins and the outs of evaluating and mitigating risk um, and implementing a business plan to achieve a certain outcome through an asset. And as I started to learn this stuff, I then started to learn about, well, wait a minute, I'm selling these assets, but you know, I'm not utilizing these assets for really what they can be for me personally. And for the people that I care about, you know, of course I was still working for money. I was still selling deals and creating commissions. And of course I had, you know, expanded my income significantly since I exited the corporate world, but I was still sort of working in the rat race. And, you know, I learned a lot about just personal financial intelligence throughout this time, you know, reading books and surrounding myself with other great people like yourself and listening to great podcasts and, you know, surrounding myself with mentors. And ultimately I decided to make my first investment in real estate about seven years ago. And it was an eight unit uh, apartment building. And it was a, what I thought was a value add. It was actually much more of a distressed type of asset. You know, it was uh, made a lot of mistakes in that deal. And ultimately, I think in many regards, if I were to look back, I'd say the, the market probably bailed me out about three years later, I exited for significant profit. Um, but, you know, along the way, I, I experienced negative cash flow. I experienced, you know, challenges with management. I experienced challenges with renovations and the tenant base and all of those different things. Um, so that was my first foray and it was challenging, but it was also successful, thankfully. What... Um you know, you had those issues. What would you attribute to them? I mean, did you just not, were they not in a great area? What were the major problems with it? Did you just, I mean, if you, from now you're looking back, you made money. Um, and obviously the market helped everybody do that over the last few years, but like how, you know, what would you pinpoint as the mistakes you made with that property from say purchasing it to ultimately selling it and managing it? So I knew exactly how to transact commercial real estate. I had done it hundreds of times to that point. And, you know, I was, my business was extremely successful and on paper, I understood the mechanisms of the investments, right. And I could advise and I could negotiate and I could, you know, transact these deals and put together great deals. But what I didn't understand was some of the reality behind these investments and, you know, in, in a book versus reality, it's vastly different, right. And, and you need both, right. You need street smarts, you need book smarts to be successful as a commercial real estate investor, as a real estate investor in general. And I think that I was just naive to many aspects of the business. I was naive to the fact that, you know, what is on paper in terms of a rent roll is certainly, you know, it's possible that that is uh, reflective in reality, but it's also possible that it's completely not. So doing your due diligence to understand what's the viability and the risk within the tenant base or the rent roll of the asset that you're investing in, you know, like as an example, when I bought this asset, I was surprised to recognize, you know, very quickly that about 50% of the 100% occupied tenant base was not paying rent. And that was shocking to me. You know, I grew up in a middle class background and, you know, we didn't have tremendous resources, but we always had this thought process of, you know, 
you, you do what you say you're going to do. And uh, if you sign a lease or if you, you know, you, you have a credit card, you're going to pay that bill. And that's just kind of how the world was when I, I grew up. And, you know, I was just surprised to recognize that that was not the case for everyone and identifying, you know, that, all right, well, if you're going to have that, you've got a plan for, you know, the contingency plan of significantly increasing your renovation costs much sooner in the investment. And you've got to plan for that. You've got to put your reserves in place. You've got to have your team in place. You've got to have your management team in place so that you can lease those units very quickly. My team was, you know, hodgepodge at best. And, you know, I learned kind of building the plane on the way down, so to speak here. Um, and thankfully I was able to put the wings on before it hit the ground. And, you know, I was able to kind of hover above the ground and, and ultimately get out of the deal very successfully. But that first foray, I mean, it taught me a lot of lessons. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you bought an eight unit property and you were having issues with the cash flowing and you talk to new investors and they're buying like a duplex or a triplex and they're telling me how much they're going to make every month. And it's a completely different story from what you're actually doing. Now, it's very difficult to cash flow in smaller complexes. I mean, unless you're buying it fully in cash, but it's a whole different investment strategy. But the thing though is that um, I, it's just, it's interesting to hear that because I know exactly what you're saying, especially with tenants. And when I used to own uh, C-class properties and my dad owned D-class, I would always say like, you know, um, in those classes, uh, a lot of the tenant base likes to negotiate as they go. And the, you know, they tell you what you want to get inside. And then once they're in there and it's like, you know, we can change this like due date on rent. And like, it's at that point, it's it's a very difficult thing because it costs you several thousand dollars to switch them. So it's just um, it's a very interesting you know getting into asset classes like that um, in a tenant basis like that. I agree. Yeah, the, it, this this deal was C maybe C minus. It was in a good area, but it was in nearby some other kind of pretty seedy areas, and I think it had just been mismanaged for so long. And and you know I looked at the deal and said, wow, you know these rents are thirty five percent below market. You know this is a great opportunity, and ultimately it was. And I was able to reposition it to that. But I think to recognize now with the wisdom that you gain in that type of experience, you can then say, okay, yes, there may be significant upside, but to get there, there's also significant significant challenge that you've got to overcome. You've got to prepare for, you've got to be aware of those sort of short-term downsides. And I, you know, since I've done several different distressed sort of investments and with the recognition of, all right, well, here's what we're going to have to encounter to get to the other side. You know, as long as you understand that fully and you have a plan for that, I think it's, it can be a great plan and it can be a great investment, but otherwise, if you're not prepared for it, it can really be challenging financially and otherwise. Yeah, for sure. So tell us about kind of what you're doing now, Tyler, what's your company's current investment strategy? Yeah. So uh, CF Capital, we invest in large multifamily communities across our region. We're located in Louisville, Kentucky, and we invest uh, north up to Indianapolis, uh, east over to Cincinnati and throughout our state and the major MSAs. And of course, across Tennessee as well, Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga. So we invest in large multifamily communities, think 200 plus unit uh, properties that have, you know, a leasing office, swimming pool, fitness center, dog park, you know, all those type of amenities, playgrounds and so forth, but also has a full-time staff on site uh, that, you know, from a leasing manager, property manager, maintenance technicians, you know, the gamut. And so, you know, what I've learned, what I did learn from those smaller assets and even kind of stair stepping up to larger assets is that no matter the size of the deal, it re requires a certain amount of attention. And of course, larger assets require much more attention and it helps to have full time staff, professional individuals who are paid a salary plus benefits and bonuses and all those kind of things to attend to those uh, type of uh, issues on a daily basis and, and help us have eyes on those assets on a daily basis. So what we do is we look for B, B minus type of assets in A or B locations. Uh, and we look for an opportunity to add value to those assets, whether it's repositioning from a uh, marketing or perceptual positioning perspective or physically through renovations uh, or and or operations. So we look for underperforming assets so that we can go in and add value to increase the NOI, increase the cash flow, and increase the value of those assets. Generally, we look at deals that we can, you know, invest in for, you know, five to seven years or so. And then we do generally 1031 exchanges into the next opportunity where we have the opportunity to add value to those assets. So that's generally our approach. And we're, we're pretty hyper focused on multifamily for many of the reasons that I'm sure your listeners are aware of. But 
in terms of the fundamentals, you know, we have an affordability housing crisis across the United States. And what we're doing is we're providing shelter for many individuals, you know, in a, in, in a generally affordable capacity. Generally, our properties that we invest in are on the lower end in terms of the affordability or the rent comp scale. And so because of that, when we look at, you know, let's say we are entering into a recession, folks that are living in luxury A-class properties, perhaps if they want to save money, they're going to say, all right, well, where are options that are still in, you know, safe neighborhoods with quality access to schools and jobs and things like that. And generally they move to our properties. And when times are going well, perhaps if folks are saying, you know what, I'm living in a C unit, but maybe I just got a promotion and things are going well in my career, you know, maybe I'm going to move to one of those B assets. And so that's really what we focus on. And as a result, we like that risk profile of the asset. And we think that it makes sense in good times and bad. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is a long game and we're in the business for the long haul. And as we invest in these assets, uh, we think it's a winning strategy for for many decades to come. Yeah, just a side note there, you had what I call the natural progression of the real estate investor, where you're starting in like a C-class and you've, you've, we've done that brain damage and now we've moved on to in the, into Bs. And Bs is a very interesting class just to kind of explain because it's just you have people that are moving into it, as you just said, or down into it, through it. At all different parts of the market cycle, people, you know, someone had like got laid off or hours reduced, they're going back to it. Someone that, like you said, got a promotion, wants better schools, they're going into it. So there's, it's it, it's an easier asset to keep a very high occupancy and collections on, and um, and you're dealing with people that will like to buy or most likely will buy a house at some point. So you have people that are actually worried about their credit score and everything else that goes with it. Um, so. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's a great plan. And I love those markets that you guys are working on very landlord friendly. Um, one one thing I want to say is, you know, you are a real estate broker, and we touched on that uh, in the beginning. But how did being a real estate broker assist you when you made the switch into an investor? I, I imagine it was like three years afterwards or so. You know, it assisted me in a big way. I mean, I think just having sort of being surrounded by people who are doing great things as investors themselves and really learning from them, you know, obviously adding value in the in the capacity that I was able to in terms of helping them put to get together deals, access deals, because I became known as kind of the apartment guy. That was really my niche. Um, and because of that, I saw a lot of transaction volume and I was able to stay in touch with my clients to help add value during their business plans and you know really learn alongside them and so there was a lot of experience that i gained through that time in my career since i've really transitioned to being full-time investor uh, over the past three or four years and really focusing on what i just described but i think that experience was tremendously valuable because it was almost like an apprenticeship program while i was able to get paid during the apprenticeship program and i did not think that when i transitioned from corporate america into brokerage that then that was my my step into then becoming an investor because it just wasn't in my purview. And I just took one step into real estate and then I noticed all of these other possibilities. And as I noticed more possibilities, I started to say, all right, well, what's the best way for me to utilize this vehicle to create the outcome that I want in my life? And you know, I was looking for more freedom, for more uh, options, uh, for a, a designing a better lifestyle. And ultimately I almost, you know, to a certain degree in brokerage almost became a little bit trapped by the success because I was just constantly in demand and it was all running through me. And yeah, I built a little bit of a team and there were some processes that we designed and, you know, that was working well, but it was also extremely demanding. And the investments that I had placed in terms of active investments uh, in real estate were doing well and they were generating cash flow. And, you know, that that taste kind of gave me the the courage to continue to go a little bit bigger. And as I continue to go bigger, I started to recognize the economies of scale uh, in real estate, in particular multifamily real estate. And obviously that can be a double edged sword if you're not careful. So I'm glad that I learned on a smaller scale and I learned a little bit on a next on a little bit larger scale. And then, of course, we continue to grow. So what can investors do to be taken more seriously by brokers? And I know we talk a lot about multifamily and apartments here, and that's what you you, uh, you specialized in. Um, so what do they do to get that call back from that broker or for someone to actually send them a listing that has been sitting on their desk for 15 months? Well, I think the first like kind of basic thing is you've got to speak the language. If you're not speaking the language, it's going to be challenging for a broker to take you seriously. Because if you think about it from a broker's perspective, in most regards, in most markets, you know, there are 
20% of the brokers who are doing 80% or more of the transaction volume. So these people are very highly in demand. They hold the keys to a lot of opportunity for investors. And because of that, they're not really, they're not going to waste their time with people who don't know what they're doing. So if you can't speak the language, if you don't have the terminology, if you don't understand the dynamics of the marketplace, it's going to be challenging to get the attention of a broker. Um, and so that's kind of basic, you know, sort of base level knowledge. And, you know, obviously listening to a podcast like this can help you with that. But, you know, reading books and surrounding yourself with other mentors, you know, attaching yourself to other investors who have been doing this for a long time and asking questions and really just surrounding yourself with people like that can help. But beyond that, it's about truly understanding all right, if I'm if I'm going to make a proposal, I've got to deliver on this proposal. And at the end of the day, if you understand the market dynamics, generally that's going to put you in a position to secure a deal, right? Because a broker is intimately involved in the market dynamics, which by the way, especially today is changing on a daily basis. It's changing on, you know, especially a weekly, monthly basis. And so the market dynamics of one month ago, two months, three months ago are no longer relevant to today. And so if you are in tune with that, and by the way, many respects it's like hey mr broker mrs broker tell me what needs to happen to get this deal done give me a sense of what's actually what are you seeing that really needs to drive this transaction and you know that can help you in terms of really understanding the market dynamics so that you can respond with your best foot forward to be able to transact but ultimately if you secure an opportunity you've got to deliver i mean because at the end of the day like i said it's a long game and if you deliver on your promises, those promises start to compound and the word gets out. And because it's a small community, as I mentioned, 20% of the brokers are doing 80% or more of the volume. People talk and it's like, you know what? We've got a pocket listing. I got three or four groups I'm going to go to because I have three or four days before, you know, this opportunity is evaporated or someone else transacts on it. And so at that point, it's just the promises compound. So I think it's just investing in those relationships, speaking the language and understanding the market dynamics. Yeah, no, that's great. It's, it's interesting how that 80, 20 works in so many different fields, but it's also, um, if you're getting, say you get on the mailing list of a broker that deals with smaller multifamily, let's say, and then a larger one, like you're talking about and that 80% or 20% doing 8% of deals, um, completely different emails that they're sending out. They're like, you know, smaller ones telling you, hey, we know we're having a Zoom call and learning to buy this and all this kind of stuff. And then the other one's like, oh, you know, here's 275 units, you know, class A that's, you know, you're getting just deal emails that come out and they're like specific to what they work on. And it's a completely different uh, audience that they are focusing on. And um, so yeah, many different things like that. But I, I found that when I when I get these emails and I see what they're really, who their clientele is and who their avatar is that they're really going after. And I'll just add one thing to that because there are times where you've got these folks who are maybe in the 20% who are, you know, or maybe they're in the 80% who are doing 20% of the deals. But if you identify somebody that you're like, you know what, this guy has upside or this gal has upside. And, you know, it feels like they've got the ambition and the grit and the willingness, the relentlessness to get to where they are, where they want to be in terms of being the top 20% or doing 80% of the deals. You know, you can attach yourself to someone like that. It's almost like a value add type of relationship uh, or, you know, an upside type of relationship. So I think it's important to recognize those opportunities in the marketplace as well through brokers. One thing, Tyler, that I just want to touch on before we leave with uh, go to the next topic from brokers is that um, many real estate agents that I meet or I know don't have investment real estate. And I, was, I, I can't believe it. It's just I tell people that and it just goes in one ear out the other, uh, especially with all taxes. And most of people don't have the 401k because they're, you know, independent contractors and stuff. And I was wondering, you know, why did you make that decision um, or how important it is for other agents, brokers to make the decision to actually get on to the equity side and get away from, you know, the whole transactional? Okay, so why I made the decision was I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And yeah. I was, you know, I was trying to grow as an individual while I was growing my business. And I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm selling these assets that he's talking about, the wealthy are <laughs> utilizing to generate multiple streams of income and and you know expand their wealth. And to me, it just like all clicked. It was a very obviously any of the listeners who have read Rich Dad Poor Dad know it's an extremely basic book, but it's a concept that, you know, it it causes you to start to unlearn perhaps some of the things that, you know, maybe people like me grew up with that were very ingrained and you know you never questioned so that was the reason why i made that move was like 
it, I was, I had access to all of these deals and it made no sense for me to do anything other than take action in an in investment direction. In terms of uh, why others don't, I, I think it's really interesting and perplexing to be honest with you, why anybody in this business would not be investing it, at minimum as a limited partner yeah. in some of these opportunities because you have access. And, you know, I think it, it a little bit of a red flag if a broker is not investing because maybe they don't fully believe in the asset. Um, and if you're selling something that you don't believe in, to me, there's a misalignment, yeah. uh, either that, or there's a bit of, uh, you know, incompetence to recognize the opportunity that they're missing out on because just, you know, working for money, I think is short-sighted. And, you know, I, I, I would value an individual who also invests, who puts their money where their mouth is, because to me, that shows me that, you know, this person really believes what they're selling. And I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a fantastic answer. Um, so you did something else other than investing as an agent, but something that I think a lot of people would want to do is your transition you made from corporate America to full time real estate investing. So tell us a little bit about it, and then tell us kind of what you would have done differently if you were going to do it again today. So it was it was kind of a process, um, as I mentioned. You know, the first step was you know becoming a broker and really learning and immersing myself kind of in the deep end, so to speak, of that and building a business by referral and meeting the real players in my market and learning from them and you know capturing new opportunities through those relationships and generating my business. And then the step from there was you know really putting my money where my mouth was and and going and failing and learning and you know by the way being really stressed out about all the challenges that I was going through and feeling like, man, I got to feed the mortgage. I got to do all this stuff. It's like, why did I do this? You know, this, this doesn't feel, you know, like it, it should feel, uh, at least at that time, I didn't feel like, man, I, they never said anything about this in the books that I read. They never said anything about this in the CCIM courses and those kind of things. And, you know, I, I kind of learned the hard way, but also I, I found that problems are gifts through that experience. And that allowed me to get stronger, allowed me to pivot. It allowed me to make adjustments for the next deal. And the next deal was 36 units. And I went in and we, you know, we had the right plan and we did really well on that deal. And the next deal was 72 units. And, you know, from there it was like, all right, now I've built a little bit of a, a foundation in terms of just financial flexibility, so to speak, where I've got reserves, I've got flexibility, I've got dry powder, so to speak, that I can look at the marketplace and make other decisions and assemble a team, invest in my team and invest in building a brand, invest in expanding our network and our investor base. And I started to learn about, you know, the opportunity to go bigger because as again, as I went bigger with my own money, I recognized the benefits of the economies of scale. And when I recognized that, you know, there's this beautiful thing called syndication where other people can come alongside us and we can go bigger and we can put a phenomenal team on the field, like staff at the assets, like a regional, uh, manager, like, you know, an accounting team, like a legal team, you know, all of these beautiful things, which by the way, this is a team sport. And once I recognize that to build a great team, you can invite other people to invest alongside you and everyone can win, you know, that really started to change the game for me. And so, um, you know, in 2019, I met my business partner, uh, actually, I met him probably about a year or so before that uh, via CCIM or, or maybe a couple of years before that via CCIM. And we built a relationship and we were just kind of loosely talking about, you know, what the possibilities could be if we were to join forces and create a business as you know many many of your listeners are probably you know have had these type of conversations just to explore business opportunities and you know ultimately long story short it became an opportunity for us to leverage each other's skill sets which were complementary you know they were different but complementary but we had a similar value set and ultimately as we recognize the opportunity via syndication that's when we created our organization cf capital so you know, that was when I decided, look, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to continue to broker because we don't want to be competitors with the individuals who are really sourcing most of our opportunities. Uh, we don't want them to think, hey, we're here to take your commissions because that's not really what we're after. We're after long term investment success. So that's really the, the pathway that I took. Yeah, I imagine you'd have some investors that are wondering if you're cherry picking deals that they are now getting um, the ones right. that you haven't. Yeah, so that's that's, that's, that's the that, catch too. Yeah. That's the catch 22 with some brokers. It's like, okay, I, I want you to be an investor, but I also don't want you to just, you know, just be cherry picking and only sell me the deals that you've picked over. Right. Right. 
Interesting. So as a passive investor and an active investor, I mean, what have you learned by being on both sides of the table, investor, operator? Ooh, I've learned a lot. I mean, you know, you learn from best practices from some of the individuals and, and teams who are doing great things. I'm an LP in, in a handful of different projects. I've learned, you know, great communication practices. I've learned very poor communication practices, which, you know, at the end of the day, I, the golden rule, treat others the way you would like to be treated. And ultimately, I think that's how we try to apply our investor relations uh, approach. Because, you know, if anybody's going to entrust us with their investment, to us, that's a massive responsibility whether it's 50 grand, $75,000, hundred grand, mm -hmm. or millions of dollars. By the way, we've had the gamut of all of those different spectrums of, of individuals investing with us. And I've learned as, a, as an LP, you know, uh, some folks share that perspective and others don't. And, you know, I think it, it makes a big difference. And I believe in transformational relationships and not transactional. And I think it says a lot when you take the time to be fully transparent and robust in your communications. But, you know, you also learn about other systems and, you know, uh, how to handle certain challenges, because, you know, that's the other thing, too, is like even even as you grow and get more sophisticated as an investor, you're still going to run into challenges. You're still going to run into unforeseen circumstances. So how are you handling those things? How are you navigating? You know, what sort of contingency plans are you executing and how you know what 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 uh, what's your behavior when your back is against the wall? Because I think that shares uh, that really shows a lot about your character. So, you know, I've learned a lot about, you know, different types of individuals and, you know, the type of people you want to invest with. And as a general partner, I mean, you know, there's a huge responsibility for us to uh, invest alongside anyone. Like I said, you know, whether they're a small investor or a large investor and across the gamut, I mean, we have hundreds of individuals who invest with us. And every single day, it's up to us to make sure that we are a good steward of their capital. We're protecting their capital and we're putting it in the best position to grow and compound and generate cash flow. And there's a lot of responsibility with that, but we don't let it crush us. We just know that we have a North Star of doing the right thing. And ultimately, we're going to continue to pivot. We're going to continue to make adjustments where needed. And I think every day is an opportunity to learn. And, you know, I always say that you know, problems are gifts, but also every problem has a solution. But by the way, the other thing is problems are the basic, the, the basis towards creating progress and mm -hmm. towards creating um, growth within your organization and growth for your investors. So, you know, there's some people who run away from problems and, you know, they just don't face them or they crumble under those problems. And I think that in the long run, if that's what you're doing, I think you're you're going to miss really the opportunities within this business. So there's been a lot that I've learned, but hopefully that's been helpful in terms of the way that I answered your question there. No, very helpful. I had a couple of questions together in one. So, um, so as we're kind of uh, closing up here, what is some of the worst investing advice you've ever heard there, Tyler? Ooh, man. Uh, you know, there's times where you kind of cringe uh, about some stuff you hear. I mean, I think that in my opinion, I think that single family investing is a waste of time. And the reason why is because, and maybe not completely a waste of time, and that could be a, a very generalized statement that could be picked apart. Um, I think it's good to get people in the game, but I also think that it's not gonna get people where they wanna go. It's not a scalable business. Um, it's not going to replace your income. It's not going to do these, it's, a, it's more speculative than investment you know because a lot of times i think people don't recognize that in some cases investing can be um, mistaken as or or gambling can be mistaken as investing and in many aspects i think single family investing is a bit of a gamble in terms of where you think the price per square foot is going to go in the future market no one can bet on the future of the market so in my opinion i think it's a little bit of a waste of time i would I would much more, you know, suggest folks start on a different asset class or a more scalable asset class. Um, so that that I don't know if that's advice per se that I've heard, but I think that uh, that could help save some people some time and some headache. Yeah, I think out of all the years I've been involved in real estate investing since 2006, I've met only one single family investor that had a scalable business model that had like a team on the ground, had like logistics that worked out that he's been doing for many, many years. So it's and how many, how many houses, how many houses does he have? Close to a hundred, but that's a scalability. Okay. So he has this right. bottom and he has like a team that handles them and everything like you would, we'd have for 
property management. Obviously, it's very difficult if you had third party for that. So he has to build that up from the ground up. Um, and, you know, 100 different insurance policies, 100 different contracts here, 100 different water bills, um, you know, everything that goes with it. But it's just it's one of those things that only one. I mean, it's just it's a very difficult model to scale versus you can get involved with a deal, um, whether you do it yourself with partners, you do it um, or if you get into a syndication, you now have that scale that's already there. You know what I mean? And there's not like a problem where somebody has an issue and you're like calling someone, hey, come to my unit. You know, there's an issue with something like this. And if you have the on-site staff, it's already taken care of. I mean, you don't even know about it as the owner. You might get some sort of uh, learn about it later on from on your weekly call with the property manager, but it's not something that it's going to be bothered with you. And you have someone that's sitting in the office, walks over there, does what has to be done and come back. And that keeps your cost down dramatically as well. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. I just think that I think that there's a better way to start. There's, you know, you should start small and learn, um, but I think there's a better way. Oh, yeah. But, you know, everybody has their own goals. And I think at the end of the day, think about your goals. That's one thing that I think a lot of people get mixed up with as well is they forget about their goals. They're just like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to invest in real estate because that's what I hear. Everyone says, that's great. Now let me go do it. And then, you know, 10 years later, they're doing that. But did they get to where they want to go or have they even thought about where they want to go? as a result of those investments. Yeah, for sure. So as we finish up here, Tyler, what do you think are the main factors that have contributed to your success? I think a growth mindset is uh, is a key. And, you know, that comes down to some of the stuff I was talking about, like when we have challenges, it's looking at it as an opportunity to grow because you do find that. And there's no question that that is the case. It doesn't feel like it in the moment. You know, that is a that is a key thing to recognize. It doesn't feel good to go through challenges or, you know, problems or whatever. But the growth mindset has been a huge key to me expanding through this. Um, because again, if, as you're growing as an investor, you're just going to encounter problems. So are you going to look at them as woe is me and overwhelming, or are you going to utilize them to propel you forward? And to me, that's been a huge piece. The other piece has just been investing in myself. Um, and that's through reading that's through engaging in conversations like this, um, investing in my own education, surrounding myself with other great people, whether it's coaches, mentors, uh, masterminds, surrounding myself with peers or people that are slightly or even far ahead of me and creating relationships with those individuals. So investing in myself in those ways, but also investing in, you know, my own health and, you know, my own mindset, my own mindfulness, my own, uh, you know, fitness and those kind of things. Like those are things that I've uh, I would attribute a lot of my success to because when you go through a stressful period or an uncertain period, which by the way, as investors, you know, you, you're going to continue to bump up on your levels of competency and to expand your competency. It's going to feel stressful at times. It's going to feel uncomfortable. And I think investing in your own health and your own mindfulness and, and perspective to say, you know what, this is this is a good opportunity for me to grow has been huge. So, uh, you know, I think understanding the the emotional side of the investing journey is important. And some of those uh, things that I just described have have really helped me along the way. That's great, Tyler. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business, CF Capital? So they can just go to cfcapllc.com. Uh, we have a free ebook. It's called The Bottom Line. And these are the 10 ways to increase cash flow in an apartment complex. So it's instructive for folks if they want to take a look at that. All they have to do is go to cfcapllc.com. Charles, I'd also mention that um, I have a podcast. It's called Elevate. And it's all about mindset, mind expansion, and personal development for high-performing real estate investors. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about today uh, is interwoven in those conversations with world-class investors and other experts to help folks elevate their performance because ultimately your performance is the foundation of your success in uh, real estate investing. So I look forward to having you as a guest here soon. I know we've got that scheduled. And um, so, you know, a couple of ways for folks to find us, but you can find the podcasts on anywhere that, you know, folks listen to podcasts. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Tyler. I will put links to your company and then also to the podcast into the show notes. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today. Absolutely, Charles. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.